good evening. This shiur bezrat Hashem will be the Yilu Nishmat, Monira Bat Hana, or the Avdi Lefuat Tamara Bat Nora. It's been ten years since Gedol Ador, Rav Ovadia Yosef Zatzal passed. Tomorrow it is your side. Yesterday I posted a video that spoke about the big danger of transferring Gush Katif to the hand of the Palestinian Hamas. In that video it described exactly what is going to happen to us. How are we gonna, they're going to be close to the Moshavim, Kibbutzim, the road to all these places that got hurt, how dangerous it would be for the Jews there, and how they're going to shoot rockets at us. Amash Chacham Adif Minavi, Chazal Seb, a high scholar of Torah, is even greater than a prophet. Everything he said happened. He says, Pikuach Nefesh, should never agree. The Prime Minister back then was Sharon, Ariel Sharon. Sharon, I don't know what happened to him. Most of his life, he was a righty. He was very much anti-terror organization. Fought the Arabs most of his life. The last few years of his life, he turned 180 degrees and made us a huge damage. This is together with the Oslo horrible agreement of Yitzhak Rabin and Shimon Perez, two more naive people who do not understand really, really what it means to deal with radical Muslim terrorists. They brought Arafat with thousands of his soldiers into Israel, Jericho, Gaza, gave them weapons, gave them cars, recognition. So stupid, so naive, that in the end they got the Nobel Prize, you know, winner for peace. The worst, the saddest, and the most hilarious joke in history. The big mass murderer who killed so many innocent people, who came into Jericho to continue with his genocide plan, the stupid world, together with the stupid lefty liberals of Israel, made that rat some kind of a hero. They gave him a Nobel Prize win, winner for peace. Can you believe it? It's like giving Saddam Hussein. Same thing, or one of these jihadists, or Bin Laden. Do you understand what we're talking here about? The head of ISIS, remember him, al-Baghdadi, that they, you know, they killed? or Suleimani, another Nazi. Imagine taking one of these monsters and give them Nobel Prize win for peace. It's not working. It's not working. You cannot fix it. That's it. No live broadcast tonight. So, this is what happened. Today, after 20 years, after what happened there, we see the results of this disaster that for every normal person it was so obvious that it's going to happen, but for some reason to our stupid leaders it wasn't clear. Or maybe they just didn't care. Either they were dumb not to see it coming. I saw it coming and I'm not a general. It was obvious to me, to, 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 to over a million Jews in Israel who were screaming against it, it was obvious. To teenagers it was obvious. But for some reason, those fools, they didn't see it coming. Or maybe they saw it coming, but maybe they bribed them. Maybe they gave them money under the table. Politicians are usually very corrupted. Very corrupted. You will never know even 1% of what's going on beyond the scene. With Biden, and with the Arabs, and who knows? Who knows what's going on behind the scene? There are many videos now that they published that it was an inside job. Usually, 
what you see it's conspiracy theories usually like the September 11 they claim the United States actually bombed the buildings what logic you have for United States to kill thousands of American citizens it ended with 3,000 dead it could have been 10,000 or 20,000 there's no way to know can control how many people will escape not escape that means the United States was willing to kill 20,000 Americans without controlling who will die. Maybe there were important people those in the buildings. Government will do it against their own people. I do not believe it even 1% of 1% of 1%. That's a pure conspiracy theory and a stupid one. But believe it or not, millions of people believe it. When the conspiracies begin, there was always going to be customers. Usually the dumber the people are, the faster it's, the easiest it is to fool them. Like when 5G came out, all these stupid people on YouTube, it's going to fry your brain, it's preparation, they're going to put a chip in your head, they will control you, they will turn you into a robot, all kinds of things. And this is what happened when the YouTube is billions of videos and so many of them are stupid conspiracies. There are a lot of stupid people in the world who follow it like it's some kind of Torah Misinai. However, in Israel, even though it's very possible, it's also a conspiracy theory. Unlike September 11, in Israel it makes a lot of sense. A lot of sense. Why? <coughs> Because it's very unlikely that in 15 to 30 places the, the fence all of a sudden was broken and not one jeep showed up. Cannot be. Cannot be. Today I heard one of the biggest, righteous, most righteous peace, peace, people in the world, Rav Yaakov Ades, the tzaddik who cries every day in a kotel non-stop. Probably know who I'm talking about. Also, by the way, a super genius Talmid Chacham with photographic memory. Everything he remembers. It's all in his head. It's, it's mamash. Unhuman. So holy. This person is so holy in every aspect. His knowledge in Torah is phenomenal. Beyond words. His level in, uh, in praying is probably the biggest in the world. I don't think there's anyone in earth on earth that can daven every day with hours of crying and screaming. We don't even do it in Tfilat Neila once a year, what he does in a regular Shachrit or Mincha or Arvit. So Rav Ades, because he's such a holy person, one of the biggest general of the Israeli army met with him. That's what he said today on, the, on, the, on his speech in a Kotel. And he asked him, how did it happen that we were so dumb and they caught us like this by surprise. We know who we're dealing with. And you know what was the answer of this general? The general told him that recently, in the last few years, the heads of the army replaced all the good soldiers with girls. Girls, 18, 18 and a half, young girls and they put the safety of the land of Israel in the hand of immature girls that do not fit the job. Silly girls, you know what girls are talking about when they are 18. They're more busy with the makeup and their shopping. The last thing they are ready for is to follow and monitor the Hamas terrorists. It's the last thing they worry about. The girls care about these things. Girls have a different kind of mentality. This is a job for lions, for men, for aggressive men. For men who cares, for men who, you know, who's waiting for the battle. Because this is life and death here. And putting the girls as one step from the fence, if the Arabs break it, the first thing they'll kill is those girls. How exactly these girls can come and fight these monsters? That's exactly what happened. All these girls were killed one by one. And he said that these girls were never ready for the job to begin with. They were not qualified. That's general. Not me. I mean, like I said, I'm not an expert. I don't know what's going on there. But he said to Avadis, they were never qualified for the job, even a little bit. 
So he asked him, so why did you hire them? Why did you give them the job? Because of the feminist women organization made constant noise that women deserve to get equal rights. I don't get it. Well, women must become men? Well, where is this nonsense come from? Women has their talents and their skills. There are certain things in life that they are million times better than men. And there are things in life that men is better than women. What is going on here? What is this urge to turn a woman, a gentle, classy, soft character woman, to turn her into a monster animal? Of having a machine gun and run and fight against these gorilla monsters. What is the urge? Where does it come from? Where is the logic here? Why do they want women to fight in tanks and to fly airplanes and to throw, to dump, uh, to throw bombs on people? What's going on over here? The answer is all from the Satan. A call from the Satan, from the Yetzirah, to mess up the world, to turn men to women, women to men, people to animals. That's what's happening right now. So now we are paying the price of this stupid feminism who forced us to do that. Not that many people know about it, but if this general actually revealed that secret, you know, now we know. But it's totally logical. What logical? Illogical. Illogical, of course. There's a lot of things that they do that is totally not logical. Giving Gush Katif, taking tens of thousands of Jews out of their homes, burning and knocking down synagogues to give it to Hamas terrorists who every day scream they won't rest until they slaughter all of us. That's beyond stupidity. Beyond. It's like calling the Nazi, come finish the job, we'll open the border, come kill us. That's really what it is. So who does it? Stupid people do it. Naive people. Or corrupted people. It could be that these people received tens of millions of dollars and they sold us out. It could be. I, I don't know. I don't have a proof. I don't know what Sharon got or didn't get. What the American promised him or the Arab promised him. Who knows? People are greedy. People will sell anything just to get 50 million dollars, 30 million dollars back there into some offshore account. Who knows what happened with this? These people are not loyal to Judaism or to God or to the Jewish nation. The last thing they care about is us. They always care about themselves, like this Barak and Olmert and all these other Rishayim Arurim. You can see. So of course, you know, this is only the stick in the hand of Hashem. We had it coming with or without them. Don't get me wrong. I don't want anyone to think that if these lefty liberal traders wouldn't be in charge, our situation would be any better. No. We have different reasons why Hashem did it to us. So now he used these wicked people to orchestrate the tragedy. Why? Because when you are wicked, Hashem puts you in the hand of the Satan to use you as he wish. When you are righteous, the Satan has no permission to use you. No permission. But when you are wicked, when you have corrupted ideology, when you anti-Torah, when you are ungrateful to your own creator, Hashem gave the Satan permission to take you, and the more wicked you are, the more he likes you, the Satan, to use you in his most advanced plans to destroy us and to destroy the whole world. That's his job. So, Rabotai, one thing I found out, two things I found out. Yesterday I found out that the Russians, thousands of Russian hackers, are fighting Israel in a cyber non-stop, supporting Hamas. And not only that, Putin himself helping them. Stage. So I asked myself, I don't get it. Yeah. Just a few months ago, Putin was very nice with us. Very good relationship with Israel. He even allowed us to attack non-stop in Syria and he never made a peep, even though he has an army there. We had some kind of a under the table agreement. Yeah. You let us attack, you know, and that's it. 
all of a sudden Putin turned against us. You know why? Again, the stupidity of our government. Why in the world they had to declare that they support Ukraine? What, what do you gain from that? So tell Ukraine, listen, we feel bad for you. We are not a part of your conflict with Russia. We do not want to pay the price for supporting you. We do not interfere with your war against Russia. Whatever it is, it's between you and them. That's it. Helping you will get us killed. Will get our people killed. Will make our situation and our efforts to survive a hundred times harder. Why do you have to show Ukraine support? Just be quiet. Not always you have to talk. As a result of that now, in the backstage, Russia is against us. Who knows if the Russian didn't help Hamas to shut down all the intelligent cameras and the systems with some cyber attack? Who knows? We don't know. We'll find out. Don't worry. We'll find out. Eventually it will come out. It was either the Iranians or maybe the Russians or maybe both. Why? When you get someone like Putin angry, he will never leave you alone. You're going to pay the price. Every one of his opponent is under the ground already a long time. Or escape from Russia and live with fear for the rest of his life. You have to know who to start a battle with. What do, you, what do we need it for? How did it help us? How did it benefit us to support Ukraine who murdered two million of our people? What even what the Nazis didn't do to us, they did. And I still admire those murderers everywhere in Ukraine. What do we have with Ukraine? They murdered two millions of our brothers and sisters in a war's cruelty and never ever apologized for that. So I'm not saying that we should go and fight against Ukraine or be happy that they die. No. We are not with you and we are not against you. You are in the hand of God. Whatever he wants to do with you, it's his business. Why should we push our nose into it? Did we gain something from it? So this is another stupidity. Now we're paying the price for it. Some of us are dying because of this stupidity. The stupidity has a price. One more thing I found out today, and that's very painful as well, that, you know, unfortunately, as much as we're successful in making more and more from people, more Jews becoming religious, there is also the other side. There are people who do everything they can to take religious people and turn them away from the religion to make them anti-religious. How do they do it? First, they show them all kinds of things who make them question the validity of the Torah, because not everyone is smart, not everyone knows how to argue with Apikorsim, with all these tricky atheists. And after they turn them away from the religion, they show them support. We have houses, like clubs, like social clubs, we will give you a place to sleep, we'll give you monthly allowance, we will support you until you be on your own in a secular society. And that's why these teenagers, they leave the house, they break the heart of their parents and their brothers and sisters, and go to some place in Tel Aviv with all the gays and all the anti-Torah over there. And once you're in the same place with this kind of people, I don't have to tell you what will happen to you a year or two later when it comes to religion, right? If anything would be left, most likely nothing is, nothing is left from the Yiddish kite. This organization, Imach Shimam Vezichram, their name is Hillel. They call themselves Hillel. And this Hillel, because they're supporting people who used to be righteous and be decided to be anti-God people, they gave them tickets to that party in the South. Free tickets to many of them. I don't know the exact number, maybe it's more than 50 even. People that became secular, that turned against their family and against Hashem. Two years, three years, five years. This is the sponsor organization. This Reshaim Arurim, collecting donations from wicked people 
to turn the souls of the children of God against him. And they sent them all to that party for free, and what happened? All of them died. All these kids died. They used to be righteous until a year or two ago, sitting, learning in yeshivot. Who knows where they are now? After what happened to them, which is already a huge tragedy, what's coming for them next? You don't even want to know. Someone who was in Torah and turned against Hashem, his olam haba will be much more painful than someone who was never with Hashem. The Gemara says, Shana u piresh, kashem ikulam. Shana u piresh, someone that was a bachur yeshiva, left the yeshiva and became wicked, mechalel shabbat, anti God. His punishment in the next world is the worst out of everyone. The worst. Sad to see 20, 22 years old kids dying in such a horrible, cruel way. Maybe some of them are in, you know, in, 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 in Gaza now, prisoners. I don't know if all of them died. Some of them maybe were captured. Imagine the girls, girls who used to be a religious girl from Bet Yaakov, who knows what this monster doing to them there every day. Think about it. Try to think for a second. A girl, religious girl, with scared, very modest, in Bnei Brak, in Yerushalayim, by a very from Litvish or Hasidish family, left the religion, escaped. They turned them into a secular, like goyot. And what happened in the end? Who knows if they're now or now? Who knows? Oh, I just from thinking about it, I'm about to faint. What they do to these girls? Ah, it's, it's very much heartbreaking. What's waiting for these wicked people of these Hillel? Words cannot describe what's waiting for them. You think the Hamas will have a hell? Wait until what's going to happen to these people. Because the Gemara is very, very clear about it. It's a terrible thing to murder a person. Everybody knows it. To be a murderer? Okay, we all know it. But there's something a lot worse than that, is to murder the soul of a person. Murdering the body, you shot in his life by 10, 20, 30, 40 years, whatever it was. But that was the body. If the person was righteous, 20 years old by righteous, he goes to heaven, he finishes tikkun. He got killed because he's a Jew. That gives him a lot of credit as well. We didn't lose. I promise you, he didn't lose. If he was righteous. If he was wicked, that's another story. Aval, what happened over here is that the Gemara says, Gadol ha-machtio yoter min ha-orgo. Someone who take a righteous person and turn him into an anti-religion God, a person, anti-God, he is much worse than someone who murdered the body. Because you can murder the body, but you cannot touch the soul. You can kill the soul. The only way to kill the soul is to take him Shomer Shabbat and make him a Chalel Shabbat. To take a Bachur Yeshiva and offer him a job somewhere in Manhattan, and a year later he became a Goy. And later he married a non-Jewish girl, and he has three kids, and they're all goyim. And one of them will be one day Adolf Hitler, and kill millions of Jews. Who is going to have to pay for the Holocaust? The one who took him out of the yeshiva. No exaggeration. Think about it. The consequences of one action sometimes can be devastating. Devastating. You take one person, you turn him into a wicked person, then he has other kids, he turns them into real monsters. I want to remind you that thousands, thousands of the terrorists from Hamas and Jihad by Halacha are Jewish. <laughs> I have a whole lecture about it. The Jews of Hamas against the Goyim of, of the Israeli IDF. People say to me, Rabbi, you made a mistake in the name. It's the Jews of Tzal against the Goim of Hamas. I said, well, I can still tell the difference between Jews and Goim, no? I won't make such a mistake calling soldiers not Jewish and calling terrorists Jews. So what's that? Can you explain? Yeah, the lecture explained. 
60,000 Jewish girls married Arabs from Gaza, Jericho, Rafiach, all these places. They come to work in Israel, they go to the nightclub in Haifa, in those place, these places, put gel in their hair. What's your name? Rafi. It's Rafik. Rafik became Rafi, Yusuf became Yossi. Yeah, Yaakov became Kobe, Yaakub. That's what it is. So what happened? They captured the heart of these naive girls. And it's for whatever reason, for the, whatever reason, I wish I knew the reason for I mean, obviously, it's all the Satan, is orchestrated by the Satan. But for whatever reason, the Jewish Israeli girls of this generation are falling in the hands of the Arab terrorists too easy. Speaks to her five minutes, she's already in his arms. It's unbelievable what's happening here. Tel Aviv, almost every girl over there goes with Arab boyfriend. And they make fun of them. The Arabs treat them like garbage. And they run after them, beg them, please don't break up with me. The stories that I hear, we cannot believe how it's breaking the heart. I have one student, one of the big shots in politics in Israel, probably 50 years old. He worked as an advisor to the biggest names in the government, including Netanyahu. And he told me, you know, I live all my life in Tel Aviv. Before I met you, it didn't bother me that every girl I meet, she has an Arab boyfriend. Because I looked at myself as not racist, you know. Okay, well, I mean, I wasn't religious, I didn't understand. After I started to listen to you, I already listened to you for more than two years. It kills me. I cannot come out to the street from what I see. Every one of these lefty girls is, has an Arab. And the one before was an Arab, and the one before was an Arab. They brag about it while the Arab make fun of them on WhatsApp groups and show pictures that they send them over there. You don't know, you don't know what's going on here. You, don't know, you have no idea what's going on here. 60,000 girls officially, that's what we know. Who knows, maybe it was more. From the time Israel became a state until five years ago, the number was 60,000. Maybe now it's much more. 60,000 Jewish girls married Arabs and live over there in those places. Gaza, Jenin, all these places. Usually a woman that married to an Arab will have minimum 10 kids. Sometimes 18. Minimum 10. 60,000 women, 10 kids in a family, all of those kids are Jewish. Yeah. They go to school, everyone curse them and, and kick them. You filthy Jew, Yahud, you kalb. And these Jews grow up with low self-esteem because everybody called them Jew. A Jew is a curse by them. You know, it's big, the worst curse. So they're trying to prove that they're Muslim. They're not, they're not Jews. So what do they do? The only way to prove that you're loyal to your country, Palestinians, is to be a terrorist. And that's what happened. They joined those organizations and they come and they kill us. What's the reason for all of that? The Torah says, Your daughters and your sons are given to other nations. You see it and you become crazy from what your eyes see. That's what the Torah says. Read in Parashat Bechukotai, read in Parashat Kitavo, all the curses. It's all happening to us, one by one. I don't think there's one curse over there in the Torah that didn't already happen to us. From these 147 curses that are written in those two parashot, I review one by one. I think there is not even one of them who didn't happen to us already. Hashem did not leave one out. It's Navash unbelievable. Everything that happens to us, we are 100% responsible for that. If we would not raise such a generation of anti-Torah, of people who hate religion so much, brainwash the children of the last two generations to always hate religious people and hate rabbis and hate bachure yeshiva, 
and admire the Israeli army, their God, and the Supreme Court, their other God. Now it's all exploding in their face. You don't know what's going on. You know how many Israelis are now totally crushed and depressed? Not only from the amount of people that died. Most of the people that died, so far it's, the number is between 13 to 1400 people and 200 in, in, in Gaza prisoners. So, so far we're talking about 1600, 1600 victims. Most of them are lefty liberals. People who gave their life for this Palestinian field, monster terrorists. There is a husband and wife that now in, uh, in Gaza, they used to drive with their car every day, collect people in the gate between Israel and these territories, and bring them to hospitals in Israel to be treated. They had a system that they taking care of them for years. That's what they do, volunteer, to come mm -hmm. take this monster, bring them to Israel, that they should get treatment, they should be strong, that they'll be able to kill us better and faster. And what was their end? They are now being tortured in the end of these monsters. Do you think that they will give them any credit if they prove to them on the phone, look what we have done for you, we gave our life for you, we sacrificed for you, why are you raping us? Why are you killing us? There's nobody to talk to. They're not talking to people. Now, finally, a lot of lefties open up their eyes. They're shocked. I can't believe they did it to them. The lefties live in some kind of illusion that they're humanic. Human rights. Human rights? Human rights to human. Not to monsters. Human rights. Where? What is human about them? People who rape children who chop their head off. People who open the stomach of a pregnant woman and pull out the baby and the baby is hanging there for both of them to die. People like this deserve any rights? People like this deserve to be treated in a hospital? In a stupid world, in a stupid liberal world where they have no God values in their life, yes. That monster deserve rights. And Bachurei Yeshiva, holy Bachurei Yeshiva, deserve to die, according to those lefties. And now I hope they will open up their eyes. Maybe we'll have less of them. Some of them maybe didn't mean to betray us, but that's what they did. And now we're dealing with the consequences of their behavior. Today, something big happened in, in, in Gaza there. You know, they shoot thousands of rockets every day on us, right? Every once in a while, one rocket is bred, is because they make the rockets. It's not such a, like a sophisticated factory. It's not United States, it's not Israeli weapon. It's weapon that is made in basements. Yeah, it's like, like auto repair places. That's how they make those, they miss the the, one of the, one of the, of the missiles went up, up, up made a U-turn in the air and hit the hospital yeah. and killed, according to them, 500 of them in one second. But, but of course they blame us. What's yeah. the question? You don't yeah, even need to waste your time asking. Wait. <coughs> but you know what happened here. What do they do, these monsters? They take their own people and use them as a shield. They don't care that a million of them will die. They can care less. The last thing they care about is Palestinians getting killed. Children, women, and they, they laugh, smoke their cigarettes. They don't sit and cry. They only care about themselves. It's like 100% like ISIS. So what happened? They hide in the hospitals. That's what they do. Because they know Israel will never dare to bomb a hospital. A normal country, France, England, Germany, United States, Japan, they won't bomb a hospital. Any democratic country has values. Even though a lot of it is fake, 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 but from the outside nobody wants to be remembered as someone who bombed a hospital, right? It's the last thing you do in the war. It's the number one war crime to bomb a hospital. There were many wars in the last hundred years in the world. You can count on one hand how many times people actually bombed the hospital on purpose. 
So what do they do, these monsters? They hide in hospitals and they hide in the United Nations places, schools, schools of, of, of United Nations. UNRWA, UNRWA, they have all these names, all these organizations, because and that's where they hide all their bombs and the missiles, because they know we cannot bomb those places. So what do they do? They hide in places that they know we cannot bomb, and when they want to defend themselves, they make sure a lot of civilians will be next to them. Those the Israeli told them, run, run to the run to, uh, run to the south. We're going to wipe out the area. Run. They kill them or they force them to go back. Go back to your homes and die. They are the biggest enemies of their people. But they don't care. They hate us so much, the citizens. These civilians hate every one of us so much. And they are so happy that even one Jew die, they give candy, they dance, they spit on their bodies. You saw, you saw the video, <coughs> civilians. What kind of a civilian is this? Civilian who danced the babies were slaughtered and their head were chopped off? That's a civilian? That's a hundred percent mass murderer terrorist. You don't need to actually kill to be a terrorist. Fact that you donate and happy when the terrorist accomplished his mission, you're nothing better than him. If you see someone rape a child and you clap and you're happy, you are a monster. You have no right to live. You don't deserve to live. In a normal society, people who dance, when they do such crimes against children and women and do horrible things to them, what they did, in a normal society, people like this will be put to death. You have to purify the world with, from such monsters. And if you had Jews like that, they also don't deserve to live. You don't deserve to live when you see someone slaughter a person, a little person. It's only one of them. So that we don't, we cannot become monster. I mean, war turned us, unfortunately, sometimes to be corrupted. We're full of rage, we're full of anger. We're full of anger, but we can never ever become like them. We cannot become monsters, go and kill children. Cannot be. Even though we know 100% that these children will be the next terrorist of the Jihad and the Hamas in 15 years. There's no question about it, because that's how they raise them. From kindergarten, they already showed them all the things, how you kill Jews, thank you. How you kill Jews, and that's what they do, little children from, uh, from five years old, they already scream, kill the Jews, kill the Jews. So those children are the next Nazis. But we still don't have the guts, we as Jewish people, to go and hurt children. They have no problem doing it. So what happened? Hashem turned the missile and he went right into the heart, like it's written in Tehillim. Harbam, Tavo Belibam. When the wicked come to harm the righteous, Hashem will turn their soul against their own, to their own heart. And that's what happened today. So 500 of them died. Things like this can be proven. You know, of course, they blame Israel. But I think someone told me that Al Jazeera in Machshimam, another anti-Semite channel, actually displayed the missile going back and hitting themselves. Not that it's going to make any difference. Because, you know, don't look for support by so many millions of anti-Semites in the world. It's, I don't know why the Israelis are so sensitive. This guy wants this, this one that, this one spoke against us, this one is pro Hamas. What did you expect? In what kind of illusion you lived? Half of the people in the world will be dancing to see all Jews are dying. They have Nazi ideology. Even here in the United States, you have millions of people like this. They have Nazi ideology. They, they hate Jews. Some of them even hate Muslims. There are many people here in the South. If they could press a button and get rid of the Jews, they will do it. And if they can press a button and get rid of all Muslims, they will do it as well. There are people living here in America, owners of businesses, some big shots in politics. That's the way they were raised, like Nazis. It's not only here, it's everywhere. Europe is full of anti-Semites. France, England, oh, not, you can't even count how many. 
So I don't understand why all of a sudden Israel is so sensitive. What did you expect? That the whole world would stand and clap for justice? Israel have the right to defend themselves, wipe them out, it's about time. How, how, how many more years are you going to suffer their terror attacks? Don't expect for sympathy. Why? Because Hashem said one sentence. Am levada dishkon, ova goim lo itchashav. In the prophecy of Bilam, what does he say? The Jews will always be lonely. Always will be isolated and always everyone will be against them. Always. Even United States. Many people are naive. Wow, you saw the speech Biden gave. I'm shocked. I'm so surprised. Now I don't mind if he win against Trump in the next election. <laughs> it was so nice. He spoke for the Jews. Maybe personally he spoke from his heart, maybe really he's not an anti-Semite, maybe he really doesn't want to see Israel get hurt. Everything maybe, 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 maybe yes. But reality-wise, who in the end give the final approval to act or not? It's United States. If United States decides now to shut us down, in 24 hours the war will be over. And we achieve nothing. That's when we were defeated. So we are, we are occupied mentally and physically by the United States. <laughs> it's like someone who adopted a child. He controls him, that's it. He gives him food, he gives him money, he gives him candy. But in reality, he can lock him in a room whenever he wants. You are a servant of someone. Instead of being servants of Hashem, we are the servants of the nations, of the United States and others. So they claim 500 of them died. I just hope that all of them were terrorists. I don't want to see children and women dying there. I hope that it's all the terrorists who hide in the hospital. You know, every bullet has an address. Whether a Jew die, whether an Arab die, in the end Hashem decides who lives and who dies in Rosh Hashanah. So every Jew who died so far, Unfortunately, it was written on Rosh Hashanah. And every Arab that died, it was written also on Rosh Hashanah. It's the same executor, HaKadosh Baruch Hu. No difference. When he executed a Jew, he executed a Jew. When he executed a Gentile, he executed a Gentile. It's in his hand who would live and who will die. And who will get hurt, who will recover, and who will not. Who would lose his business, who would lose his home, who will have to move away to exile and run for his life. Everything is written in Rosh Hashanah. Abutai, it's written in a Torah. It's written in a Torah, Ki Hashem Elokecha mithalech bekerev machanecha. Hashem, your God, is walking inside your camp, inside your territory, to save you. He's your guard, he's your keeper. And to surrender your enemies in front of you. You should know that the condition for that is that your territory has to be holy. Your place, Israel, or other Jewish communities, keep it holy. How do you keep it holy? Make sure there is no lack of modesty. There's nothing I hate more than violations when it comes to men and women. Men and women mix, all kinds of horrible parties, naked people jumping like monkeys all night for three days, <laughs> dragged up, inter, inter relationship with Jews and non-Jews, men and women that are not married, committing the worst, Isurei Karet, and all the other things, Hashem Yerachem. This I will not tolerate. This kind of behavior, will have massive, devastating consequences. 
what is the, what's the consequences? I would leave you alone. I would leave you. I won't guard you. I would leave your camp. I'm not with you. I'm not watching over you. I leave you in the hand of your enemies. It's a verse in the Torah. I want to remind you, I did not write the Torah in case you are confused. I'm only reading to you what's written here. Ki Hashem Elokecha mitalech bekerev machanecha. Hashem is walking around you in the streets of Israel. Leatzilcha, to save you. Lateto yvecha lefanecha, to surrender your enemies under you. Vaya machanecha kadosh. Make sure your territories are holy. Everything that has to be covered, make sure nobody can see it. Meaning modesty. If I will see Ervat Davar, if I see naked women on the street, I'm sorry, but I cannot be in such a place. Once I go out, who comes instead? The Hamas mass murderer field. They take my place. You have to decide who do you want to be, in, hand, in my hands or the hands of these monsters. And what did we decide? Obviously, we didn't know what we are doing, but now we understand. That's why a lot of Israelis now are waking up. I was on the radio for more than an hour on Sunday in Channel 2000. Once the show goes on, we ask people to accept on themselves mitzvot that they don't keep. In one hour, we had more than 50 new Shomrei Shabbat. In one hour show, more than 50 people, and I'm kabel, or mekabelet al atzmi to keep Shabbat. Some accept birkat hamazon, some accept to pray, some accept to put filin. Everyone accepts something on himself. But for me, the most critical thing is Shabbat. Why? Because once you become Shomer Shabbat, everything follows automatically. Yeah. If you become, uh, if you put filin, there's no guarantee you'll, do, you'll be a Baal Tshuva. If you start saying Birkat Amazon, there's no guarantee you'll be a Baal Tshuva. If you pray once a day, there's no guarantee you'll be a Baal Tshuva. No matter what you do, we cannot call you a Baal Tshuva. We cannot call you a religious Jew. You give tzedakah to the shul. You secular, who gives tzedakah? You make brachot here and there. You secular, that make brachot. You put filin. Secular, that put filin. Everything you do, you still defined as a secular Jew. Except one thing. Once you become Shomer Shabbat, nobody will call you secular anymore. People already know you become Baal Tshuva. That's not perfect. You still have a long way to go. But you cannot deny that you're becoming religious once you become Shomer Shabbat. Why? Because Shabbat is the foundation of everything. Once you keep it, it would lead to everything else. And it's also uh, very logical and very normal. Why? Because you begin to start coming to the synagogue. You see a lot of religious people. You meet people. They invite you. You sit in their table. You see the family. You see the religious kids. You hear the divrei Torah. Then they give you a book, read this, watch this. You know, you begin, you're starting to change your lifestyle. Plus, in the synagogue, the rabbi is giving two, three speeches on Shabbat, and then they say, well, there's a shiur before Mincha, why don't you come? It's always like that. Mitzvah, goreret mitzvah. Once you open the door, Hashem opens other doors for you. That's why Shabbat is the first thing we have to push. Also, one more thing that is very important to push, to get a commitment from them that they would listen to at least one hour of Torah per day. Better, of course, to listen to speakers that wake up the people to do tshuva. Not these American speakers who say, you have to be besimcha, you have to be besimcha. <laughs> That's all they talk about, besimcha. How can we be in simcha? Thousands of people are being slaughtered because of the way we are. Hashem is so disgusted by us that he had to bring on his own children such a horrible tragedy. Be besimcha. What does it mean, be besimcha? Soon I'm going to prove to you that it's all nonsense what they say. I'll prove it to you. I don't, don't have to take my opinion. I'll read it to you from the Rambam. What do we have to really do right now? 
Be besimcha. You have to be besimcha that you're a Jew. It's a wonderful gift. You have to be besimcha that you are able to keep mitzvot. 100%. You have to be besimcha that you're able to learn Torah, or to give tzedakah, or to save souls. Every time you do it, you have to do it with great happiness and satisfaction that you have the merit. However, when you see tragedies and when you see that Hashem is smacking us big time, now it's not the time to dance. Don't be stupid, please. You know, I tell you one thing. I know one person that I was able to make him a Baal Tshuva and he left the religion after this tragedy. So that's it. I cannot have it anymore. Why did he leave the religion? I'll give you one guess. Huh? You would think he saw what Hashem did to his children so he doesn't want anymore to be religious, right? That's what you would think. Lack of emunah, like she said. It's not the reason. He already learned enough by my lectures that sometimes Hashem hug and kiss us and sometimes he give us a horrible smack. He already learned that everything in life is reward and punishment. He's not questioning that. He also knows that everything Hashem does in the end is for good reason. Even when we deserve to be punished. But why did he leave the religion? Because he saw American Jews dancing as usual in Simchat Torah. When they already knew that a thousand people were slaughtered in Israel. They just couldn't see it. I tried to convince him and say, listen, mitzvah to dance with the Torah. Without the Torah, we wouldn't be anything. So, yes, of course, I love the Torah. I want to dance with the Torah. But how can I dance with the Torah when my brothers and sisters just got slaughtered? How can I do it? Mitzvah, not mitzvah. How can I do it? How can I do such thing? Sometimes people use it as an excuse, you know. Some people have desires, they just want to go run back to their old bad ways. And they find something that is a strong excuse and then they run away. It didn't help these few dozens of Jews who left the religion and went to that party. They got a free ticket from this lousy, wicked organization, Hillel. They got them free tickets, they sent them over there to the party as a reward that you became secular, reward. And all of them got butchered there, or they're now sitting in Gaza being abused. No one can win if he turns away against Hashem. You know, the Americans say, if you can beat him, join him. It's very much applied to our situation. What do you want? You have two options. You want to declare a war against Hashem like Santa Claus did with his book? Or you want to put your head down and say, Hashem, what do you say? Lecha Hashem atzedaka velanu boshet apanim. Like Chazal say. יפה דנתנו, יפה גזרת עלינו, לך השם הצדקה ולנו בושת הפנים. נחפשה דרכינו ונשובה, ונחקורה ונשובה אליך. The guilt is 100% in us. Don't you ever dare, I'm giving you a good recommendation for your own good, don't you ever dare even to hint that what Hashem did to us ever, not just now, ever in history, was not fair because you you rebel against the principles of the Torah. The principles that Hashem set for Judaism is He reward the righteous and punish the wicked. Sometimes He punish the, the righteous as well. If the righteous did something wrong, Hashem punish the righteous. But overall, in the end, everyone will get what they deserve. Whether he dies younger or later, in the end, everything will be calculated. There's no such thing, oh, he didn't deserve to die. There's no such thing. It's kfira to say it. If you say about someone, wow, oh, he was such a nice person, I can understand why Hashem did this to him. He didn't deserve to die like this. This is heresy. If you see children are being murdered in a worst possible imaginable way, like we just saw, first reaction is, they don't deserve it. 
Where is the justice? Where is God? That's heresy. That's heresy. That's worse than eating pork, speaking like this. The same people that asked this question, they wouldn't dare to eat pork. Here, pork, eat it. I'll give you a thousand dollars, eat it. Come on. I'm a full person. Eat it. No. Eat it or I break your bones. I won't eat. Break my bone. I won't eat pork. Saying such thing, oh, it's not fair, there's no justice. Why children have to get such thing? It's heresy. It's worse than eating pork heresy. Heresy is a very big crime. Listening to heretic speaker, it's a very big crime. Organizing a lecture for him is a million times worse, because now you're Mahdi Arabim. So what is it? I don't understand why children die. Why? Because I don't know who they used to be in their past life. I don't know. Only God knows. Any child who died immediately go to heaven. So it's good for him. It's terrible how he died and suffered for a minute or half a minute, whatever they did to the child when they shot his head. But the suffering of the child was maximum a minute. You agree, right? How long does it take to die? Someone shoot you or stab you or choke you. One minute suffering. After that minute, that soul goes to heaven next to the Rambam and Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai for eternity. So it was a good thing for that baby or no? If the baby would stay alive and ended up in Tel Aviv, in the parties, or dancing around the Buddha statue, it would be better for him? Then he would lose his share to the world to come. So what Hashem did to him was mercy or judgment? Mercy. Because anyone who died before Bar Mitzvah, believe it or not, I know it's very hard to digest what I'm saying, but that's the divine truth. Everyone who died before Bar Mitzvah or Bat Mitzvah for a girl goes express to heaven. So that was a gift or that was a negative thing? It was a gift. But after all, he could have died going to bed without suffering. Why did he have to die in such a horrible way by this monster? Because Hashem wanted one little thing to finish with him from past life. Since he's sending him now to heaven, a second after the soul goes out of the body and goes to the court of heaven and they welcome this child and show him his place in the eternal world in the highest level of pleasure, do you really think that he will ever regret the minute that he got a bullet in his head? Who, who should regret those who were older? 30, 40, 50? Thousands of Shabbatot they didn't keep. You know, I want to tell you last week, I get a video, and the video said, name of some Israeli guy, let's call him Itzik. Itzik was to go, was supposed to go under the chupa next week. And he just died yesterday in the war. So instead of playing the chupa song, it was played in his funeral. It's a horrible thing, no, to get such a video. Immediately you begin to cry. And then you read what's on the stage. Itzik was supposed to get married to Ben Zugo, to Avi. This is what they're bragging about. Itzik was supposed to marry in a public event to a man next week. They had a chupa song. They make chupa, they get some reform dirt to come to perform the ceremony against Hashem, which is abomination. I don't care. He was supposed to get married next week to a man. And now they make it so dramatic. Wow, they play this chupa song on his wedding. The point I'm making here is these liberal corrupted reporters already a long, long time ago became so sodomized, so terrible in their ideology, so wicked, that it doesn't even have one percent difference between a man marry a woman to a man marry a man. They already adjusted it 100 percent. They don't see a difference. That's how corrupted they are. 
These Arab monsters see the difference. Those murderers who chop people's head. You're wondering to yourself, how can it be? A Jew became such a such an abomination and those monsters will not dare to do such thing? It breaks the heart. And if you go and tell them, you know, this kind of behavior, that's what got us to where we are in first place. They'll get ten times angrier. And they will hate their religion even more. Because King Solomon already spoke about this phenomena. It says, Adam tesalef darko, ve'al Hashem is af libo. The stupidity of a person will turn him away from the right path to Hashem. And he is going to blame who? He is going to blame Hashem. I want to read to you, Rabotai, the words of the Rambam. I don't want you to go and say that I say. Many times people say, Rabbi Mizrahi say, Rabbi Mizrahi say. Rabbi Mizrahi say nothing. Rabbi Mizrahi read what's written in the books. Gemara, Rambam, Shulchan Aruch, Chumash, Zohar, that's all. It's written in Tehilim, chapter Kuf Mem Daled, 144, verse 14. Do you know what it's written? Do you know what's the meaning of this verse? I repeat. אין פרץ ואין יוצאת ואין צווחה במחוזותינו. ברחובותינו, in our streets. Translation. There is no preachers, meaning there are no women in the street that are not modest. None of them go out to the street with not modest clothes. They're not modest, they're inside the bedroom. Permitted. There is no Jewish girls go out to the street with not modest clothes. This was written 3,000 years ago in Tehilim. 3,000 years ago, when the most not modest woman then was more modest than any rabbit sent today. In case you don't get the point. But even in modesty, sometimes there are minor issues and they're critical. Because Hashem does not compromise on modesty at all. Elokim sone zima, vaya machanecha kadosh, vera becharvat davar veshav macharecha. I'm going to leave you immediately. Mixed wedding, Hashem is not there. It's not there. He cannot enter the hall. Everyone naked under the chupa, Hashem irachem. People don't get it. Oh, you fanatic. Oh, you're an extremist. No, no, no. I'm just sticking to the text which I didn't write. You want to modify the, the divine book? I don't. I don't dare to do it. I rather say, the desire made me sin, that's the truth, and I am the criminal. I rather say that than to say no. What I did is the truth, meaning the Torah is incorrect. I know better. Marry men with men. That's the right way. They even give them Birkat Kohanim. Yevarechecha Hashem veishmerecha. This idiot. I'm a Kohen. As a Kohen, you go. Your mother is not Jewish. His father is Kohen. Mary Christina. So the guy comes to give Birkat Kohanim to the two gays. So what does it mean, en peretz ve'en yotzet? No woman dare to come out to the public territory, not modest. And that's why, en tzvacha b'rchovotenu. No one scream, no one mourn, no tragedies in our streets. Meaning, if women go out like that to the streets of Israel, what comes? Screaming and crying and funerals. This is a source. Give you a thousand sources. I have more than a thousand sources. No exaggeration. More than a thousand. Between the Gemara and Tehilim and the Zohar and the Chumash, more than a thousand. 
I just gave you two, three now. You get the point. What David Amelech wrote in Tehillim? It's all Beruach HaKodesh. Hashem speaks from his mouth, this entire Tehillim. You read it, you get the point. No women go out into the public territory, not mothers. That's why no one scream and no one cry. There's no tragedies, no reason to scream. Meaning when they go out like this to the street in Machtiot Arabim, one tragedy after the other comes. You get the point, right? It's written. I didn't write it. I want to remind you. No women go out to the street not modest. It's not what you imagine today, the way the girls dress today. Come on. That's very provocative. 3,000 years ago, what would be considered not modest to a woman? What would we consider an unmodest? The clothes? You're out of your mind? Every woman would wear like a tent. Look at pictures from 100 years ago. Do you know that in 1900 in the United States, a not modest woman would get a fine on the street? Police would give her a fine. It would be against the law. Did you know that until the 1960s to be gay was a crime? It was a felony in the United States. You can go to jail for that. The Goim understood the Torah until then. Now they all got corrupted in, in those democratic European American countries. And Israel followed them. All of a sudden the truth changed. Wow. What was good 50 years ago, all of a sudden now it's the opposite. People became wicked, that's all. It's not, by the way, the first time. It happened in Sodom and Gomorrah, and Hashem wiped them out. It happened in the Babylonian Tower, and Hashem wiped them out and gave them serious punishment. It wasn't the first time. It happened in a flood. Everyone died. Only one family survived. Now one person left in the world. Yeah, the world didn't have 8 billion people, not even 1 billion. But I would assume that tens of millions of people died in a flood 4,200 years ago. Tens of millions of people. So, today no one has any idea what I'm talking about. If someone now, secular person, listen to what I say now, what, do you, what would he think? That we are not normal, we're crazy. My, maybe he believes in God, but he never ever heard about the Torah and what the Torah say or not say. He has no idea. Whatever they brainwash him in a public school, in a university, liberal university, that's his ideology. Once all of a sudden he meets someone that comes and tells him the truth of the Torah and proves to him the Torah is divine, he gets the shock of his life. Some people react to shock by running away. Cannot handle the truth, run away. Ignore it, pretend they didn't see it. And some people put their nose down and their ego and say, that's it, you can beat him, join him. You can't declare a war against Hashem. What would I gain? The end, I have to pay the price. Rabotai, it's no joke here. It's mamash no joke. Let's read to you, Rabotai, an unbelievable thing that happened to King David 3,000 years ago. One of the most righteous people in the history of the world. What I'm reading to you comes from the book of Samuel A, chapter 30. Please go and read it with English translation. David and his people came to a city called Ziklag, in the third day. The Amalek, those Nazis, the Nazis came out of Amalek. Who is Amalek? Amalek, the king of Amalek was Agag. Agag and Aman, who wanted to kill all Jews in Persia, Aman Agagi, from the family of Agag, who came from Amalek. And the Nazis also came from Amalek. Edom, Esav. 
So Amalek always tortured us, always attacking us, always, similar to what the Palestinian Hamas do, or Hezbollah, all this kind of, same thing with Amalek, attacked us in, uh, when we came out of Mitzrayim, now they're attacking in the Negev. Where is the Negev? Exactly where the tragedy happened. The south. Nativot, those areas. Sderot. So we've been already in that scenario. Amalek comes to the city of Tziklag. Vayaku et Tziklag vayisrefu ota. They burn the city of the Jews. Ba'esh. Vayishbu ota nashim. They capture all the women. Similar to what happened word by word to what just happened to us 10 days ago. Vayishbu ota nashim. They capture the women. Asher ba mi katon ve'ad gadol. From babies to the oldest people. They took them prisoners. Lo imi tu ish. They didn't kill the prisoners. They took them. Vayin agu vayilchu ledarkam. They went to their direction. Vayavod David vayanashav el ha'ir. King David arrived with his people to the city. Vayinez srufa ba'esh. Nothing is left. It's all burned. Unshem uvnem uvnotem nishbu. They took their children, their the boys, the girls, the wives are all by Amalek. Who knows what they are doing to them? This wicked, evil Amalek. Vaisa David veAm Asher ito et kolam vayifku. They all started to cry. David cry. All his people, they all were crying. Until Ad Asher en vaEm koach lifkot. They just couldn't cry anymore. They were fainting, that's it. You know, you cry, you cry a day, two days, how much you can cry? In the end, you have no energy to cry. You're about to faint any second. You're dry, you didn't eat, you didn't drink. You're fainting, that's it. You have no more energy to cry. This was the situation, Rabotai. Ushtei Neshei David Nishbu. Two of the wives of David are now in the hand of Amalek. Achinoam ha-Israelit ve-Avigail. Avigail, in English Abigail, and Achinoam, two of his wife. Vatetzer le-David me'od. It broke the heart of David. Why? Because the nation wanted to stone him to death. The Jews, they hold him responsible to what happened. Everybody begin to demonstrate against him. Look at the situation he was in, poor David. His two wives and the children are taken. The whole city is burned. And the people now want to kill him. Doesn't even have the mind to start thinking about his family that are in the end of these monsters. He has to deal now with people who wants to kill him. Why? It's all your fault. They were so devastated for their children, the boys and the girls, not knowing if they are alive or not. Where are they? Where are we ever going to find them? wasn't like today, Red Cross, Google, you can search, news, you can see video, satellite. You didn't have all of that. That's it. Who knows where they are? They're alive, they're dead. There's no way to know. Everyone wants to take their frustrations on David. What did David do? Before I tell you what he did, I want to ask you, what would you do in a situation like this? A religious person, his daughters, his sons, his two wives are taken by the cruelest enemy, Amalek, of those days. They're nothing compared to the Palestinians. They already went even worse than the Nazis. Aval at that time, it was the worst option to fall in the end of Amalek. And now your own people wants to kill you. They blame you, well, our children, our daughters, our wives. Out of pain, they try to escape goat. They try to find someone to blame. What would you answer to them if you are David? What would you do? Some people would say, you're right, kill me. I don't, I don't have to deal with this misery. 
How can I live knowing my wives and my children are in the hand of these monsters? This poor American, his eight years old daughter was taken by the Hamas. They couldn't find her body. They're looking all over, nobody. So they assume that she's in Gaza. And you know what they do to girls over there. I don't have to tell you these pedophiles what they do. He was going crazy until the next day they called him and they said to him, we found the body of your body. She, she's not in Gaza, she died. And what did, he, what did he scream? Yes! Thank you, God, that my daughter died and she's not in the hand of those monsters. I would have done the same thing. If you know who you're dealing with, you deal with civilized people in a war, and they're taking prisoners, they give them food, they don't touch them, until one day they exchange prisoners, right? They let the Red Cross come and check them out. They give them some rights. There are laws about how to deal with prisoners. But when they fall in the hand of such monsters, you can only imagine the worst thing that can happen. The worst. For sure it will happen. So no, maybe yes, maybe not. When he found out that his daughter died, he started to thank Hashem and scream, yes, yes, thank you, God, thank you. This, this is enough to explain who we're dealing with. He knew. He's not stupid. That's what happened in the Holocaust. Many righteous women would rather the children die than to put them in who knows where. They rather they let them die and go to heaven. That's it, with all the pain. So what did David do? He didn't say to them, kill me. What did he do? Vaitchazek David Beashem Elokav. What did he do? became stronger in his faith in Hashem. Be'emunah. It's all from Hashem. Thank you, Hashem. It's all from you. I accept everything. Vaitchazek David. He became strong. Everyone wants to kill him now. His own wives are in prison. His children are who knows where. Who knows what they do to them. What is it? Some people would say, let me kill myself and get rid of this misery. Come, take me, do whatever you want to me. What did David do? Vaitchazek David Hashem, Rabotai. Even a soul is on your neck and you don't see even 1% of light, of hope. You must be strong with emunah to Hashem. So, let me explain the whole thing again, just that you, to make sure you understand what's happening here. The Amalekim came, they killed, they butchered people, and they took a lot of prisoners. The two wives of David, his boys, his girls, they are all by the end of these monsters. Chazal are explaining to us the situation. Why Hashem gave such punishment to the people of Tziklag? The answer, machloket. They had disagreements, fights, lack of unity, baseless hatred. Exactly like we had in Israel the entire year. If you remember all the demonstration, all the, all the Lashon Hara. This kind of behavior by the people brings the most cruel enemies immediately and give them power to hurt us. This is the Gemara, Rabotai. After this tragedy, David cried until he could not cry anymore. No voice coming. And the nation of Israel wants to kill David. Rashi says, why they wanted to kill him? They want to blame him? What's the, so they just don't know anymore what they do because their heart is broken, their children are in capture. Rashi says that they blame David for being reckless. Why, did you, you, why didn't you leave guards in a city, an army? 
You know, these Amalek are looking to kill us. You should have, you should have left security. <coughs> right? It's all because of you. And what David do? Pray to Hashem, cry to Hashem, work on his confidence, his emunah. Kibel al atzmo et adin, Chazal say. He said to Hashem, thank you for your fair just, just judgment. I made a mistake. It's all on me. I take responsibility. I pray and I beg to Hashem for mercy. That's what he did. Vayishal David be'ashem le'emor. David asked Hashem, erdof acharei ha'gdud hazeh? Should I follow and chase the Amalekim? Should I chase them? Asigenu? Will I be able to find them? Vayomer lo Hashem, Hashem say to him, redof, chase them. Ki asek tasig, you will catch them. Ve'atzel tatzil, and you will save everyone. All the people, all the prisoners. Why? What happened over here? The answer the Gemara says, after they all did tshuva and cried like this and accepted the judgment, it's all on us, Hashem. You are fair. You are a fair judge. You gave us what we deserved. We asked for forgiveness. Everything turned around. Army, no army, United States, Boats are coming with airplanes. All of that is nonsense. If every Jew in Israel would do tshuva, do you know what would happen tomorrow morning? You wouldn't hear the word Gaza ever again. But we do it the hard way. Even though Baruch Hashem, tons of Jews in Israel now, I don't know if they did full tshuva, but definitely partial tshuva, almost everyone did. Soldiers, every soldier almost now in the Israeli army has tzitzit on him. Did you know that? Did you know that? More than a hundred thousand tzitziot they gave to soldiers. The religious one already had tzitziot. The non-religious. The general of the army, one of the top three, he said in a battle, all the soldiers are always religious. <laughs> One person sent me the article, said, Rabbi, it's similar to what you say in your lecture. In the hospital, everyone is religious. In the army, battling such monsters, not knowing if you go back ever to see your family or not, it could be the last day of your life. Everyone become religious. The question is, why only there? Why in a hospital, in a cancer department? Why in a battle with the monsters all of a sudden everyone has time for Hashem? Why when they're in Tel Aviv and in other cities with beautiful life and everything works for them, why over there they forget Hashem? Now when they need Him, all of a sudden everyone is religious. I promise you right now, without knowing anyone personally, but I put money on it that many soldiers who non-stop spoke against rabbis and against Haredim the last year are walking now with tzitzit. I have no doubt about it. If 100,000 soldiers put tzitzit, a lot of them are lefties. It's half enough. Israel is half enough. So at least few thousands of them were anti-religious people. How they agree to put tzitzit? If a soldier will come and say, don't give me this nonsense. I'm anti-religion when I'm in Tel Aviv in my bed, and I'm anti-religion when I'm here in Gaza fighting. Don't sell me this nonsense. It, it doesn't work on me. Oh, at least he has this clear ideology. Mistaken, but at least he's not bouncing from one side to the other. The fact that he agreed to put tzitzit showed that all alone he was not really anti-religion. One Chacham in Israel said this week, when you see other Jews are hating so much the religion and religious people, what's the source of this hatred? Where does it come from? 
The answer is jealousy. It cannot be that you live by the truth and I live in the mud, in the darkness. I am a, a drug addict to my desires. I can control myself. I have no direction in life. All I want is drugs and clubs and beach and vacation and nothing else in my life. And look at you, you, your family, your children, with this modesty, holidays. It kills me. But I'm a drug addict. I can't leave my drugs. So instead of blaming myself, I blame the successful one. Let's put him down, that he'll be miserable like me. If you don't believe me, you know I have proof. So I'll read it to you. Don't say I made it up. I made it up. Who knows which Gemara talks about this subject? Quick, who knows? Gemara in Masechet. Where is the doctor today? He didn't come. <laughs> Masechet Psachim. Well, they, they together, huh? When he comes, he comes. When he does, psh, very nice. He takes him. He takes him. Oh, he's the driver. Okay, makes sense. Gemara in Masechet Psachim, page 49. Mem Tet. Am Haaretz. What's Am Haaretz? A total ignorant. A Jew that doesn't know Torah and doesn't have the proper manners. Midot, personality traits. Let's read the words of the Gemara. Tanur Abanan. Le'olam imkor adam kol ma sheyesh lo ve'isa bat talmid chacham. A person should sacrifice everything he owns. Everything. House, today cars, belongings, money, cash, jewelry. If the only way for you to get a daughter of a high scholar of Torah, a daughter of a rabbi, to become your wife, you have to give everything you can in order for you to get that extra ultra religious girl who grew up in the house of a Talmid Chacham, to be your wife. Everything you have. כל מה שיש לו, ויישא בת תלמיד חכם. וואי. שהיא מת, או גולה, מובטח לו שבניו יהיו תלמידי חכמים. If you're going to die, or go to exile, or you get captured in a war, or whatever the case may be, you know your children will be in a good hand. Of whom? Of her father, your father-in-law. He's going to adopt these kids and teach them Torah. And nothing is more important than that. Now they don't have a father. If the father-in-law is a total amaretz, total ignorant, doesn't even know how to say brachot, no wonder the kids will go off the path completely. But if it's a high scholar of Torah, immediately take custody of those boys and will turn them into Talmidei Chachamim. So now when you are already in the next world, you can see your children from the next world, how wonderful they turn to be, and how much they benefit your soul. Because if you leave righteous kids in the world, every mitzvah and every Torah they do or learn, benefit your soul forever, after life. The Gemara continues. Do not agree to marry a daughter of an ignorant Jew that if you die or go to exile, your children will also be amei aratzot. Your children will also be total ignorant. Gemara continues. You should do everything you can to marry a daughter of a Talmid Chacham. And if you have a daughter, make sure you do everything you can that she marry someone that is great in learning Torah. High scholar of Torah, Talmid Chacham. Mashal, le'inve ha'gefen be'inve ha'gefen. What is it? Similar to, you take the seeds of the grape, and together you plant them with other seeds of grape, which is a wonderful thing. Why? The two best fruits in the whole world, it's grapes. That's the, the nation of Israel is compared to grape. 
It's very good that the grape goes together with grape. Do not, ma do not marry a daughter of Amaharetz or marry your son to, uh, to, to do a girl that is uh, his daughter of Amaharetz. Why? Because it's similar to the seeds of the grape and the seed of the thorns, the bush, which is a very ugly thing and cannot be accepted. You take the greatest fruit and the worst bush and try to mix them together. Terrible. The Gemara continue. If a person do everything he can to marry a daughter of a Talmud Chacham and he cannot find, there's none. He should marry the daughter of Gdol Ador, the leader of the generation. What do we learn from here? That back there in their time, Gadol Ador doesn't mean he was the greatest in Torah. There could be other people who know more Torah than him, but they're anonymous, they're not leaders. Like Rav Ben Zion Abba Shaul was the biggest Chacham on earth, but he didn't want to be a, a leader of hundreds of thousands of people. Rav Ovadia Yosef was a leader. Rav Eliashi was a leader. Rav Shach was a leader. Many of those great Talmud Chachamim were big leaders. They're not only great in Torah, they were great in helping the generation to do, not to do, to direct them. But some Chachamim don't want this. They want to sit and learn. They don't want to be bad there half of their days accepting people, giving them advice, because it hurts their Kedusha. All day they have to see wicked people coming, you know, asking questions, you know. They have to go into their conversation with them. They speak about not modest things. He doesn't want this. He wants to be in holiness all his life. So it's very possible that there is a, some kind of a chacham somewhere that hardly, maybe 2,000 people in the whole world knows who he is. And the other one, everybody knows who he is, but that chacham is greater than this. But if you cannot find him, go for the daughter of Gdol Ador, which is a second degree. <laughs> second degree, Gdol Ador. Lo matzah bat gdol ador. You didn't find a daughter of gdol ador. Isa bat rosh rashi knesiot. A rabbi of a shul. What we say, local rabbi. It's not some giant chacham, but he knows how to answer the community questions. Lo matzah bat rashi knesiot. Isa bat gabay tzedaka. You cannot find a daughter of a rabbi of a shul. Find a daughter of someone who is in charge of charity. Collect from the rich and give to the poor. Why? What's so important about it? It's like a clerk. How exactly it's going to benefit yourself or your son? The answer in the old days, they did not nominate to such a job anyone unless he was 100% honest. With dignity. Clean hands will never touch a penny that it's not his. That's also very good for your children. If you die, someone like this will raise them. He will make sure they learn Torah, even though he's not so great in Torah, but at least he has very, very clean hands, not some kind of a, of a corrupted crook. Lo matzabat gabay tzedaka, isabat melamde tinokot. You cannot find someone who's in charge of charity. Find a rabbi of a cheder. First grade Rebbe, teach kids. I would think that Rebbe is greater than a Gabay Tzedakah. No. Why? Who does he teach? He teach kids to read. Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Bereshit, in the beginning, Bara Elokim. <laughs> Big deal. Every religious Jew can almost do it. Doesn't mean you're a Talmud Chacham. Dope. Ve'alisa bat Yehudi Amaret. No matter what, do not agree to marry a girl that comes from an ignorant home. By the way, everything I told you doesn't apply today 100%. Who knows why? Who knows why? Because girls go to school today. In the, in, the, in the time when it was written 2,000 years ago, there was no such thing girls going to yeshiva. 
בית יעקב, until Sarah Schneider started בית יעקב, girls did not go to school. There was no such concept, even secular girls. The rest of the women did not go to school. Women would take care of the home, of the cows, of the sheep, of the chicken, they would sew, they would clean the parsley, they would sell in the market, they would sew garments, knit, doing all kinds of cleaning. That's the way the world was. Women were proud to be housewife. Not like now, they brainwash them and turn them into men. She has to work 12 hours a day in the office all day with all kinds of lions and guidos. Destroy the life of our women with the corrupted society we live in. Women were proud. Today, a woman, if you tell her, ah, it's just going to be all your life in the kitchen, raising kids, changing diapers, taking care of the, of the sheep, taking care of the, of the chickens, collecting the eggs. Sure. I want an educated guy, Rabbi. Can you find me Shiduch? What would you like? Educated. No, if at least she wants educated in Torah, very nice. No, she doesn't care about Torah. Educated in university. He knows about Tolstoy and Shakespeare and all the rest of the nonsense. How exactly is going to help her, that educated guy? Now you may say, well, she, she means money. Educated, she means, she doesn't want to say, find me a rich guy. So she found a nice way to say, find me a professional, <laughs> academic, educated. <laughs> I always thought that that's a nice word to say, find me a very heavy duty guy. <laughs> Until one time, I had this girl, and uh, I wanted to set her up with the son of one of the richest Jews in the world. <coughs> and uh, she asked me, is he educated? I say he went to yeshivas, but he didn't go to university. She said, no, no, I want educated. I said, what do you need educated? His father has $15 billion. You're going to live in a mansion with servants. You're going to have uh, the life of a, of a princess. How exactly is going to help you if you know some math or some dentistry or to be an architect? <laughs> You're going to be loaded with anything you want. No, I don't care about the money. Oh, she has an ideology. They brainwash her so well that she wants a poor educated guy. Unemployed. I care she has a degree. He got a degree from Bernie Sanders and his friends. And Chuck Schumer. Do you see how can you brainwash a, a, a brain of a girl or a, or a boy and turn them into a corrupted robot? So sad what they do to the kids. Even parents here in Flatbush that worth over a billion dollars brainwash their kids no matter what, you must go to university. And then they pay the price. Three years later, when the boy come with some girl, Christina, I will convert her. No, we don't accept converts in our community. Yeah. I would leave the community. I will never talk to you again. I don't care. He sells his own family, he sells the money, give up everything, and go and marry her somewhere. And then the father regret, why? Why did I send him to college? Why? What was it for? You have a billion dollars, just put him into business. Anyway, you learn everything while you begin to work. I remember once I went to Toronto, the guy who invited me was a dentist. And uh, he said, Rabbi, why don't you come to my uh, office? i show you the office. Okay, we have, it was in the, the lecture is at night. It was 1, 2 p.m. I went to his office, beautiful office. Looks like a very successful dentist. Has a lot of rooms, you know. So I asked him, Tell me, if I would come to work here with you and you teach me from A, from A to Z dentistry, everything, teach me how to clean, filling, root canal, every, whatever you do, how long will it take me to be exactly like you, professional dentist? He said to me, maximum three months. That's it. 
So I would know everything you know, say everything I know. Three months, from morning to evening. 90 days. How many years they sit in dentistry school? College plus dental school, how many years? More than 10, huh? The biggest scam in the history, colleges. 95% of what you learn there is not necessary for your future, for your profession. You can ask Benji, he'll tell you. <laughs> I'll show you how, that. you know, I, I once read an article that 80% of the Americans who went to college do not do anything that relates to what they learn in college. Meaning they find a different job. What are you? Insurance broker. So why did you need to teach business in Baruch College? To become, I could also be an insurance boy without education. Just go and get a job and become a salesman, sell insurance. They teach you all the policies, you learn two, three weeks, and you know how to sell. Right or wrong? Right. It's a big scam, big scam. The Rambam became a doctor without college and without medical school, and he was better than any doctor you know. Anyone. How did he learn? People used to teach each other. Doctor teach another person. He become a doctor, and he, you know he works with a doctor and he learns the job. Same thing you learn construction. How all Arabs are in construction? Every Arab, Ahmed. What do you do? Oved be shibutzim. Shibutzim. You know what shibutzim? They want to say shibutzim, but they cannot say p, so they say shibutzim. They call themselves Palestinians, but they cannot say P, so they say Palestinian. <laughs> that just show you the scam of the Palestinians. Who invented the name Palestine? Who knows? The Romans. The Romans made fun of the Jews 2,000 years ago, and they named Israel Palestine. After who? After Plishtim, Palestines which has nothing to do with the Arabs, it's a different nation. They used to be in Gaza. Gaza in those areas, they used to be Plishtim. Those are the ones who killed Shimshon, or Shimshon killed them together. Shimshon was fighting Delilah and the Philistines, and not Arabs, they're not from the children of Ishmael. So now Arabs from the Middle East came to the Holy Land and sat over there, and name themselves after the name that the Romans made up. But who are these Arabs? Egyptians, Syrians, Iraqis, Jordanians. It's all our regular Arabs from the Middle East. There's no such a nation, Palestinian. There's no such thing. Until 1964, nobody ever claimed Palestinians. It was not, all of a sudden, all, there's a nation, a new nation. They have no history. No history books. They never had a government. They never had a flag until then. They never had an anthem. They never had a representative in the United Nations. There's not one museum about their history. It's regular Arabs. And by the way, through their names, you can say from what country they came. Professor Mordechai Kedar is a world expert to Arab history and Islam. He knows Arabic better than them. He argue with them in Al Jazeera and make fun of them about their Quran, which they are so ignorant about. <laughs> he told the guy, Jerusalem is not mentioned in the Quran. So the Arabs are starting to laugh. <laughs> are you crazy? Yahud, you crazy? Jerusalem is not in the Quran? Say, yeah. Show me Jerusalem one time in the Quran. All of a sudden it became serious. By the way, I saw an interview a few months later with that host. And they asked him, what was the most embarrassing moment in your entire career as a journalist? He said, when this professor Kedar told me that Jerusalem is not mentioned in the Quran, I thought he's totally crazy. It's out of his mind. I started to make fun of him in live interview. And after thousands of times I spoke about Jerusalem, Jerusalem is holy to the Muslims, and this Jew come and tell me in my face that the root Jerusalem is not even mentioned in the Quran. And later I found out that he's right. I didn't know where to hide. <laughs> <laughs> so Professor Kedar, he says, you tell me their last name, I'll tell you from what country they came. He know the tribes. 
אל מסרי from Egypt, אל בגדדי from Baghdad, they have names, through their names you know where they came from, similar to the Jews. The last name of the Jews, Sfaradim or Ashkenazim, you know where they came from. For instance, you have a lot of Syrians, their last name is Ashkenazi. Moshe Ashkenazi, Yosef Ashkenazi, David Ashkenazi. Ashkenazi is European, Ashkenaz. Why Syrians name Ashkenazi? That means that their parents came from Ashkenaz into Syria. And after a few generations, when they came, so the Syrians, how the, how the Syrians will talk about them? Who are you talking about? The Ashkenazi. The Ashkenazi. Ashkenazi, Ashkenazi, it becomes their last name. Lemanshal Goldsmith. Someone who was dealing with gold. The last name shows where you came from. A lot of the people you know. For instance, Iraqis, all of them have last name that is a first name. Moshe, Ovadia, Yosef, all the Iraqis, David, their last name is regular first name, the Iraqis. Like Ovadia, Yosef, David, Nahum, Moshe, Avram, that's their name, Iraqi. So you know right away, Iraqi. Persian, all their name finish with An. Gamrian, Shansian, Bukhari, Ov, Ov, Ov. Kafkazim also, some of them, Ov. <laughs> Russian. So from the name, you know where the people came from. Kafkaz, Afghanistan. Anyway, Rabotai, We'll go back to what I was reading to you about the Ame Aratzot. The Torah says, I'm embarrassed to read it. I have to skip. If you want to see what's written, read it in Gemara in Masechet Psachim, page 49. The Chachamim define what Am Haaretz is. If you, read, if you read it and you are in Am Haaretz, you have to cry for two weeks straight. So I'll skip that. And the Gemara continues, and the Gemara says, Amar Rabbi Akiva, if you have to go on a trip, on a journey, make sure you do not go together with Amar Haaretz. Asur li tlavot imo baderech, shenemar ki hu chayecha vorech yamecha. Why? If I want to walk and someone next to me is complete Amaretz, doesn't know Torah, why should I not take him with me? The answer is, Rabotai, Al chayav lo chas, al chaye chavero lo kol sheken. He doesn't care about his own life, doesn't learn Torah, doesn't care about his olam haba. If we have a problem and a journey, he would care about me? He doesn't care about his own neshama. Better to take someone that care about you know, Torah and no Torah. I skip a lot of the things because I, it's very, very offensive. Rabbi Akiva said, when I was in Amma Aretz, before I became Baal Tshuva, I would say, give me a, a Talmid Chacham. Give me someone who knows a lot of Torah, ve'en shachenu kechamor, that I will buy in him like a donkey. Amru lo Talmidav, a student told him, Rabbi, Emor kakelev. You should say, I would bite him like a dog. Dogs usually bite, not donkey. Why you say, bite him like a donkey? Amar laem Rabbi Akiva, ze noshech ve shover ha'etzem, ve ze noshech ve en shover ha'etzem. A dog that bites, he doesn't have the ability to smash the bones, to crack the bones and turn them into powder. When a donkey bites, there is no more bone. That's it, you're done for life. Tanya, Raya Rabbi Meir Omer, Rabbi Meir Omer, this is the greatest rabbi ever lived, right here in this page, the greatest ever lived, the greatest Tanaim. Kol Hamasi Bito Laam Haaretz, everyone who married his daughter to an ignorant Jew, who was an ignorant Jew, an Israeli jet pilot, Bibi Netanyahu, the president of the Supreme Court, Every lawyer in Israel, every doctor, every cardiologist, all of them are me'aratzot. I don't want you to, 
to get the wrong impression here. Am Haaretz means someone who doesn't know Torah well, but he's a great mathematician, I can care less. He's the head judge in Tel Aviv court, I can care less. He's a cardiologist, he's a brain surgeon, I can care less. He's a jet pilot, he's an intelligent guy, he's high IQ. Nobody can predict. He doesn't know any Torah. Aaron Barak, Shem Reshaim Irkav, in an interview a few months ago, he said, I'm very sorry that I never learned Judaism. He didn't know how to say Shema Israel. He had to repeat what the guy said. He's 90 years old, the head of the Supreme Court, professor in Harvard for law, law school in Harvard, Israeli man, very intelligent, have a lot of degrees, sent a lot of innocent people to prison in his career, and set up a lot of terrorists free that they should kill more Jews, fought everything that Hashem loved, helped everything Hashem hated, destroyed Israel from inside. No one made a bigger damage to Israel like this Rasha Merusha. And he couldn't say Shema Israel. Age 90. That's Amaret. You marry your daughter to someone like that, Shem Yerachem. I will be more precise. Let's see what Rabbi Meir say. Kol HaMesiyet Vito Amaret. Kiilu Kofta Umanichata Lifne Ari. It's like tying her to a tree in front of a hungry lion. The hungry lion walks in the area. The girl is tied to a tree. She can't move and the lion is coming closer. That's how it compared to. Ma'ari dores v'ochel af ama aretz makeu bo'el. Same way a lion gore you with his head and then stick his teeth in your neck and rip it apart and kill you. First he hit you, then he swallow you alive. Say, that's how Amaharetz is. He beat up his woman and forced her to have intimacy. Whether she's in a mood, she's able, she's not able, doesn't care. She's an animal. He attacked her like the lion attack his prey. This was written 2,000 years ago, Rabotai. If the Chachamim would live today and they see domestic violence, what happened today in the world? Every other woman get punches and abuse and who knows what. Forget about the Arab world. I don't even want to start. But even in our world, what it became. So it says like this: Mario odores vochel af amaaretz makeu boel ve'en lo boshet panim and he has no shame. It's not even embarrassed how he became. Why? Because he doesn't have to lie. He became worse than an animal. Tanya Idach, the Gemara say, on the other hand, Il male tzrichim anu laim lemasa umatan, ayu urgim otanu. If they wouldn't need us to be their customers, meaning they make money of us, the Haredim, they would rather kill us. That's how much they hate us. This was 2,000 years ago. That's before the demonstrations in Tel Aviv against the Haredim. This, this was in a generation that people saw Chacham would kiss his hand. But the Chachamim told you, make no mistake, they hate us very much, the ignorant Jews. They cannot stand Chachamim. Even in their subconscious, they can't stand you. Why? It said the only reason they don't kill us is because we are their customers in a business. They need us, they sell us jewelry, they sell us food. We are their customers. Tanya Amar Rabbi Elazar, Kol Aosek Batora Bifne Amaretz, Keilu Boel Arusato Befanav. If you show your divine wisdom in front of an ignorant, wicked Jew, it's like taking his wife and have intimacy with her in front of him. Do you understand what I just said here or no? It's like doing the worst thing you can, uh, you can imagine to do to a man. What can be worse than that? Take his woman in front of him and do what you do. <laughs> it's that sentence. That's how it compared to learn Torah and to show knowledge of Torah and speak about the Torah in front of those haters of the Torah, those lefty liberals like Bernie Sanders, Imach Shimo, and the rest of his friends. 
It drives them crazy. It will be a miracle if you had a gun that he doesn't shoot you. A goy would respect it. This Amaharetz, Rasha Merusha, is willing to kill you. Why? Just be quiet, I don't want to hear your Torah. Doesn't care. He doesn't care, he can't stand it. שנאמר, תורה ציווה לנו משה מורשה קהילת יעקב, אל תקרא מורשה אלא מאור עשה. תורה ציווה לנו משה, משה ordered us the Torah, מורשה, מורשה means ירושה, inheritance. The Jews inherited the divine book of God. מורשה and מאור עשה is similar. It's hinting that the same way the Torah is inheritance, it's also like a marriage between us and Hashem, like a chatan and kala. Then the Gemara concludes and we move on. Gdola sin'a shesonim ame haratzot et ha-talmidei chachamim misin'a shesonim avodei kochavim et Yisrael unshotehem yoter mehem. Translation. The hatred that the ignorant Jews have towards the high scholar of Torah, the Bachure Shivot, the Rashi Shivot, the Chachamim, Gdole Ador, they hate them so much, more than what the Goim hates them. Those Arabs in Gaza, you ask him, how much you, have Rav, how much you hate Rav Ovadia Yosef from zero to a hundred? Connect him to a light detector. Maybe it will be 70, 80 percent. There are people he hates, we hate more. How much you hate him, the Chacham of the Jews? 80 percent. You go to this Aaron Barak and his friends, all these liberals. How much you hate him? 5,000 percent. There's no words to describe how much I hate them. I once drove to the Golan Heights, I saw a huge sign. Haredim, goes, go back to the gas chambers. Someone put a big sign on a mountain. Haredim, meaning ultra-Orthodox religious Jews, go back to, to, the, to Auschwitz, to the gas chambers. And their wives, even more. The wives of the ignorant people, the fancy lady, when she sees the rabbi, oh, she's very allergic. Don't bring him here. Why you donate? We have a problem. Let's donate to the yeshiva. No! <laughs> I remember this one guy. He wants to donate a hundred dollar a month to Kirov. After two, three months, he said, Rabbi, I have a problem. What? My wife go crazy when she saw that I donate. She's, she hates religion, but you especially she hates. <laughs> because everything you speak about, it's her. And she can't handle the truth. So she say, if you continue to donate to Rabbi Mizrahi, I will divorce you. I'll take the kids and leave. But I care about my soul. So I want to continue to donate. But can you do me a favor? What? Don't charge my card in... Rabbi Mizrahi Kiruv Organization's <laughs> website. Use it in a supermarket in Monsi. I say, what? He say, yeah. When she see a name of a supermarket, she would ask me, how come there's a supermarket in New York? I will tell her that I support a poor family. I let them use the card for $100 every 15th of the month. Why? <laughs> she cannot stand religion. You understand? And if ever the card is declined, don't leave me, please, any message on the WhatsApp. She check my messages. <laughs> Just leave me a message to call you, and we'll talk on the phone when I'm alone. For hundred dollar a month. Uh, it sounds like he's about to give me as a building or something. <laughs> no, no, no joke. You think it's the only one? This is the words of the Gemara. And the Gemara concludes, Shana hu piresh, kashem ikulam. Someone who used to be religious, 
and left the religion is the worst one. There's no one that hates religious people and rabbis more than him. Why? It reminds him of how it used to be. They stay righteous and I became wicked. Psychologically, he knows he's here and they are here. He cannot take it. What is it like? You and your friend grew up together. He went in the right direction and became someone great and you went into crime and horrible lifestyle and became some drug addict junkie on the streets going in and out of jail. Every time you see that friend, you want to kill him because it pinched your heart. I was greater than him in school. I remember from my father, Alava Shalom, that he was in school in the uh, south of Tel Aviv. It wasn't such a great area where, he, where they grew up in those days. And there was one very famous professor in Israel. He went to Mahon Weizmann, he became a top world scientist. And he was in my father's class. Every time they showed him on TV, I saw how my father is suffering. Why? He's cutting diamonds, working like a slave from morning to night all his life. And the guy was sitting next to him in a class, became a world-class professor in Mahon Weizmann, in one of the greatest institutions for science in the world. And, he, oh, and always my father used to say, but I was greater than him in English. <laughs> I was the best in my class in English. So I asked my father, why only English you learn and nothing else? He said, because I knew there's no future in Israel financially. I was preparing for the day that one day I will meet an American rich Jew from America and she will take me to America and I will have the life. And in the end, I got your mother. <laughs> Do you get the point or no? He already thought if I have any chance to have a future financially, if I get out of Israel and go to America. It was very hard days in Israel. Remember, Israel was just the beginning. It's, there was the first years of the state. Life was not easy. Financially, it was very difficult. But from that class, one of the greatest scientists came out. It's very similar to someone that was in yeshiva. He was great. I tell you, I had in Sukkot someone by me that was in our yeshiva 15 years ago. When I was, maybe 20 years ago, when I was still teaching in yeshiva gemara, he was there. And he was, he's a very sharp guy, very smart. But after a few years, he was in yeshiva, two, three years, he went to work. Met an American girl, got married, had two, two kids, got divorced, yeah. and went back to work, now he's working. Every time he come to me for Shabbat or for holidays, and we go to the yeshiva and he see all the guys arguing, Torah, learning, it kills him. Say to me, I, I could have been, he looks at my brother in yeshiva, what he became. He see other people who used to be when he was there, how great they are in Torah now. They have six, seven, eight children, all of them great, brilliant kids, holy, modest, classy. He goes to eat by them in Yom Tov. He see his life, he see their life, Shomer Mitzvot, still religious. He looks at them, he says, ah, it kills me. I could have been like them. I said to him, you could have been much better than them. Your potential is greater than them. Look what they became and look what you became. And he said to me, I, I'm thinking about it all the time. Maybe I made a mistake of my life. I said to him, no, it's not too late. Still can go back and learn. Ah, now I have to pay child support, this, that. I'm a slave of, the, of, my, of my reality, that's it. And it's so true, and it happened to so many people. So many people, they see their friends from yeshiva, what they became. Then they look at their life, what they became. Some of them left the religion. They married even non-Jews. They went to some countries. I don't know, marry Chinese, Thailandi girl. She eat mice in a plate in his house. And he's thinking, oh my God, look at the wife I chose. 
Yeah, no, no, no joke. No joke. They eat cockroaches and, and worms and all of that. You know, one of the, the, the Chachamim asked, why did Hashem made worms? Why do we need worms in the world? Now everything you have to check. Flower, maybe they have worms. Fruits have worms. Vegetable have worms. Everything green, full of worms. Why Hashem made worms in the world? It's a nightmare. What do, they, what, do they, what do we need them for? What? Forget about the worms. Only problems. Barely half of the things you have to check ten times before you eat. There are certain things you can never eat, like figs, broccoli, you have to cut the, the top of it. There's no way to clean it even. Bodek, I don't know. So, one of the answers, you'll be shocked. You'll be shocked. The answer is, worms really, the world could have survived without them. They're not, not, not so necessary to the creation. Yes, they are used as food for the birds, for, you know, other animals eat them. Hashem could have made them different food. Doesn't need really worms. But one of the answers is kind of shocking. Hashem said, every time the Jewish people rebel against me, and they deserve, God forbid, execution, meaning they don't deserve to stay alive. They really deserve annihilation. I looked at the, I look at the worms that I created for no need. Could have managed without them. And I say, what, the worms that have no benefit to the world, and who needs them? Everyone would rather live without them and I keep them alive and take care of them, my children, which are billion, trillion times more important than these worms, isn't it needless to say that I should defend them and protect them and not, and not, and not clean them from the face of the world? I only have one kushia about this. What the Chinese would eat if there would not be worms? In China, they come with a big barrel, you open the lid, you look inside, you get the shock of your life. A lot of things are moving. Grasshoppers, worms, cockroaches. And they sell appetizers, small mice, still moving. They put them in a plate with soy sauce, <laughs> few broccoli, you know, no joke. No joke, in my own eyes I saw. It's very, very common. They take two sticks, pick up the mice, which still move his tail and his head, throw it into his mouth, after he dipped him in a soy sauce, and then he eats a little bit from the broccoli. And worms, they have a cup like this, stereophone cup. The guy picks up all the cockroaches and the worms, fill up the plate, he pays him. On the street! open up his mouth and dump all the worms into his mouth and eat them. How much money I will have to pay you for you to agree to fill up your mouth with cockroaches and, and worms and swallow it? A thousand dollars, who would agree? Two thousand, three thousand, five thousand, ten thousand. No, be honest. Ten thousand, one shot, you swallow it. 15,000. <laughs> she said not even 50 million. Do you know some of these Chinese, if you give them $10,000, they live 10 years with that in the village in China. They make themselves a little straw house. They eat rice and some insects. And life is uh, very primitive. No electric there, nothing. They get water from the lake like the old days. If you come and tell him, I'll give you $10,000 for you not to eat the worms. <laughs> He's going to jump to the sky from happiness. You won't agree, huh? even for 10000 to eat? Imagine if I tell him, I want you to eat the rat in order for me to give you $10,000. I eat it for free, why you have to pay me? <laughs> That's the reality of the world, Rabotai. By the way, when you say in the morning, Baruch Shelo Asani Goy, 
You do not think about this kind of guy. You have to think about Biden, Trump, Hussein Obama, the king of Saudi Arabia, Michael Jordan, successful people. That the whole world is jealous with them. I don't know, Hollywood movie stars, all these people that have hundreds of millions of fans. No joke. If you think, oh, bless you, God, for didn't make me the guy, the homeless guy in December collecting quarters and freezing in Manhattan. And then, you know, nobody wants to be, even the other going don't want to be him. Ah, but if I would be Michael Jordan, the best player ever in the history of the game, made a billion dollars, successful, you know. Why not have such life? Houses everywhere, servants everywhere, everyone bow down to him. You know, I had the life. Without basketball, what would, what would he be? Work in a baker store until today. A basketball made him a billionaire. He knew how to play better than anyone, became what he became. This is what you have to have in mind. Bless you, Hashem, for making me an ordinary, simple, poor Jew. I rather this a billion times more before a prince or a king or anyone that is not Jewish. Even if it's a righteous Gentile. Righteous Gentiles go to heaven, Hashem loves them. They're not idol worshippers, they're not murderers. They follow the guideline of Hashem. They are very righteous. But if you are a righteous Jew, it's a higher level. If you are a wicked Jew, maybe it's better to be a righteous Gentile, yeah. Now, Rabotai, before time is finished, we have about 10 minutes left. I want to read to you the finale of tonight. I left the best to the end. Let me read to you the words of the Rambam, what we have to do in a time of tragedy. You ready? This is Ilchot Aniot, Rambam, Zmanim, Perek Rishon, first chapter, Halacha Aleph, first Halacha. Mitzvat Ase Min HaTorah, Mitzvah from the Torah. Lizrok, to scream, Ulearia Bachatzotzrot, and to blow the trumpet, meaning to, to, to put sirens. Today we have sirens, we don't need trumpets. But in the old days there was no sirens. So when tragedy arrives, they blow the trumpets in the city. And everyone knows something horrible is happening or happened. <laughs> For every problem that comes to the public. It's a clear verse in the Torah. When problems come and pressure you, blow the trumpets. What for? To inform the people. It's time to repent. It's time to gather together and pray and cry to Hashem. Klomar, kol davar sheyatser lachem, everything that will put you under pressure, like no rain. Months, no rain comes. No wheat, no barley, no fruits, no vegetables. Or billions of grasshoppers came and ate all the green. There's nothing left. Etc. It's time to blow the trumpet. This is one of the way to repent. It's a way of repentance. When tragedy comes, and everyone scream to Hashem and blow the trumpets, do a call. Everyone will know what they will know. Who can guess? Everyone will know what. Everyone already know that grasshoppers clean all the trees. They don't need the trumpets to tell them. You go out and you see. You see billions of grasshoppers coming like clouds, filling up the place. Or oh, that this pandemic, people are dying from viruses every minute. Or oh, that the goyim attacking the city, and then any minute they'll kill everyone. Everybody already know what they need, the trumpets to tell them. They go from word to mouth right away. Listen to the words of the Rambam, it's very precise. 
בזמן שתבוא צרה ויזעקו עליה, when the tragedy come and they scream for it, they are you, meaning they already scream before even they blow the trumpets, meaning they know about the tragedy. They scream to Hashem. ידעו הכל, everyone will know, שבגלל מעשיהם הרעים הוא רע להם. Everyone will know that we are now paying the price for our crimes against Hashem. That's what everyone has to know. The trumpets are not to inform you that there is a tragedy. It's to inform you now, if you don't repent now, tomorrow will be too late for you. Your last chance to save your life and your children. Now you have to repent. That's the situation we're in right now, today. Every one of us. Every Jew in the world, not only in Israel. If there won't be Israel, there won't be Jews in America or anywhere else. We will be next, what do you think? What do you think? When Jews were in exile, they constantly suffer anti-Semitism and attacks. And even that Biden said in his speech, he was 100% right. If there's no Israel, there's no safety for the Jews, no matter where they are. He said that in his speech. If he understand that, we might as well understand that as well. Rabotai and Rambam continue. Shebiglal ma'aseim ha'raim hu'ra la'em. The tragedy came because of our sins. Kakatuv, as it's written, avonotechem itu. Your sins, your intentional sins, turned everything against you to the negative side. Itu means turned from the positive into the negative. Vezehu shigrom lahem lasir atzara mealem. And this, and I, I say it clear, this and only this, only this will remove the tragedy from them. Not the United States, not the United Nations, not the great Israeli soldiers with all the respect and love I have for them, and appreciation and gratitude. They're just people. And if Hashem decreed something, the greatest soldiers would lose to these Arab farmers, monsters. Who well, just yesterday didn't learn how to shoot a gun and look how they succeed. September 11 is the best proof. Bunch of Arabs never knew how to fly. They went few few lessons to classes in Florida, learned how to fly a big Boeing plane and flew directly into the twins. Do you know how many how many success they have in those days? Over here, over here, or everything succeeded for them. That plane, this plane, what's going on here? Shem decided that that's what's going to happen to America and there's nothing you can do about it. Same thing what happened to us. If we move on business as usual, where are you? Tomorrow we fly to Florida, vacation, winter vacation, Rabbi. What do you mean? People are dying every second to defend the Jewish nation. How do you have the head to go on vacation? Rabbi, we planned it before Sukkot. No. So what? The situation changed. It's the only time we can go on vacation. So your brothers and sisters will die and get raped and their children will... will their head will be chopped and you're going to lay in the, by the pool in Florida or by the beach, even worse. Where is your heart? Only, I only care about myself, Rabbi, I'll be honest with you. I'm not Israeli. I'm American. American. I'm first American, then I'm a Jew. <laughs> That's how the Germans also spoke in Germany before Hitler came. I'm German. They changed the Sidur from Jerusalem to, the, to Berlin. Changed their name to German names. The rest, you know what happened, right? If you won't scream, and you don't blow the trumpets, they will say, That's the way the world is. Tragedies come. Grasshoppers come. Viruses come. Wars happen. You know, that's the way, they, that's the way it is. 
זה ממנהג העולם הראה לנו, וצרה זו נקרה נקראת, מקרה, קואינסידנס, נייצ'ר, no rain, the ozone warmed up, help us to save the ozone. הרי זו דרך אכזריות, this is cruelty, cruelty. וגורמת להם להידבק במעשיהם הרבים. If you don't scream to Hashem and repent, and you don't blow the trumpet to wake up the hearts of the people, this is cruelty. Explain to me please why it's cruelty. Let's see who understands. What's cruelty over here? You can say it's stupidity. It's wickedness. It's ungratefulness. Why cruelty? Because by not repenting, you're causing more people to... Because thousands of people will die because of that. When you don't care and you don't repent and you don't scream and you don't cry, more will die and more will die. That's cruelty. You don't care that your brothers and sisters will die in a horrible way. The Rambam continues. הרי זאת דרך אכזריות, cruelty, not only the Nazis and the Hamas are cruel, you are also cruel. I'm suffering and I'm cruel? Yes, because you could avoid the suffering and save people around you, or maybe save yourself and your children. וגורמת להם להידבק במעשיהם הרעים, they are stubborn, they don't leave their sin. I can't, I can't live without it, Rabbi. Whatever happened, happened, I'm sorry. ותוסיף הצהרה צרות אחרות, a new tragedies will come, not just what they have right now. Tomorrow will be something new. Something new! הוא שכתוב בתורה. What does it mean something new? Hashem is so angry at us. He's giving us one smack. And we move on like nothing happened. Ah, we said, we cry, you know, we feel terrible, but we don't want to change. We don't want to stop with our nonsense. And Hashem, see, let's uh, just wait that it will be over and we can go back to our routine criminal lifestyle. What does Hashem do? Add more punches, different kind, worse. What caused that? 100% us. שנאמר, it's written in the Torah, והלכתם עמי בקרי. What does it mean in פרשת בחוקותיי? If you don't listen to me, and you continue with your nonsense, והלכתם עמי בקרי, who knows what does it mean, והלכתם עמי בקרי? You said it's an incredible. קרי, it's מקרה. Ah, coincidence. Nature, random, bad luck. It's Obama's fault. Iran's fault. Hezbollah's fault. The anti-Semite Goins fault, the stupid army, the intelligent who fell asleep, the stupid prime minister. Maybe they all have share in the disaster, some more, some less, but with or without them it would come to you, because it's the end, he got the approval of Hashem, why don't you understand? והלכתם עמי בקרי, והלכתי עמכם בחמת קרי. I would leave you to coincidence. אוקיי. Okay. You want to play this game? That's the game you get. כלומר, הרמב״ם explain, כשאבי עליכם צרה, when I bring you a tragedy, כדי שתשובו to make you repent, what's the purpose of tragedies? To wake us up to repent. That's the, that's the purpose of it. It's not revenge. It's to shake us up. כדי שתשובו. אם תאמרו שהוא קרי, if you say it's not God, it's coincidence, it's random, it's nature. That's the way nature is. The Chinese made a virus in, in one over there. COVID is the Chinese, they did it. Chinese, not Chinese, maybe they did. What, would, what difference does it make? Hashem decided it's going to come and check the whole world. If you're going to say it's random, 
I will add to you more of this, what you call random. Meaning more punches will come. Now the Chachamim added, it's mitzvah to fast. Until Hashem will turn into, from judgment to mercy. And to scream, and to pray, and to beg, and to blow the pr- trumpet. And the shofar, which is the judgment. But you don't do it on Shabbat and not on holidays. What do you mean? It's a big tragedy, Shabbat. Tragedy! Shabbat, you don't blow the trumpet. And you don't fast. Why? Shabbat is a special day. It's not a day for mourning. Even if someone's father died, or whatever happened, Shabbat is back to normal. You don't moon on Shabbat. But you got the point. I think we covered everything. I also wanted to speak about Bereshit. But no, it's got too late already to start with that. You can go to previous year's lectures about Bereshit. Any questions before we finish? Um, if someone who is not so religious, let's say, starts saying for Kotah Shachar, no, no. There's a difference living like a goy or being a goy. We imitate the way the goyim behave. It doesn't turn us into goyim officially. It's just we just look like the then the culture of the goyim. But we don't need to convert if we want to do tshuva. The goyim wants to be like us. They have to convert to Judaism. Same thing with Shabbat. He's count 100% like an anju, 100%. However, the minute he say, Hashem, forgive me, chatati, aviti, pashati, I'm not going to be mechalel Shabbat anymore, immediately he turns from rasha to beginning of tzaddik. He turns right away to a different highway. Even though, he's, you know, yes, a minute ago he was very wicked against Hashem, and now all of a sudden he changed his attitude and his behavior. He doesn't need to convert. I always give a beautiful mashal about it. There are two people that are not allowed to drive right now. Reuven and Shimon. Now, give me a ride. I don't have a license. What do you mean? I saw you driving. Yes, I, I'm suspended. That's Reuven. Reuven used to have a license and it got suspended. Shimon never had a license. Both of them are not allowed to drive. If they drive and a police offer, officer pull them over, he will arrest them. Driving without a license, suspended, or never had a license. He's going to go to jail. What is the difference? Reuven that had a license and lost it, that's a Jew that is Mechalel Shabbat. He was born with a Jewish soul, with a ticket to life of eternity, but he did not follow the instruction on the ticket. So he got suspended. The ticket is suspended. Your license is right now suspended. You count like an Anjou. You're not a driver. What do you mean? I know how to drive. I was a driver, yes, but now your license is suspended. That means you have no permission to drive or to drive people. Once you fix what you did, or pay the fine, or you know, then you're immediately able to drive. You don't need to go again to take classes and pass the road test. Why? As soon as the suspension is removed, you're back to be a driver. That's a mechalel Shabbat. The other one, is never, he's never been a driver. He never took classes. He has to learn and to pass the road test to get a license. Both of them right now cannot drive, but there's a difference. One has to pay the fine or to remove the suspension and he can drive right away and the other one has to go to a process to become a driver. That's the goy. Want to be a Jew? Tfadal. Welcome. But, yalla, start learning. <laughs> After you learn, you read the book Welcome to Judaism of the Tzaddik Rabbi Binyamin Golan. Shem Ishmerev Vichayehu is a great person. And he, and he he put in one book everything a guy needs to know in order for him to be a Jew. 
everything. In one book, until now you needed 10 books. Combine everything based on his experience many years in the Bed Din, converting so many people. Now he made it very easy and with pictures, with beautiful pictures, everything is so clear. You read it once, you're already very knowledgeable. The 13 principles of Judaism, how to pray, everything. In one book. Very easy today to be a Jew. We order the book on divineinformation.com, 30 bucks. A few months later, you're ready to already kick, kick in. <laughs> Any more questions? Baruch Hashem. We're done for today. Baruch Adonai Le'olam. Amen and Amen. Rabbi Hanani Aben HaKashia Omer. Ratzak, Kadosh Baruch Hu Le'ezakot, Israel.